tonight on CBC Vancouver News. And this has now got me off the street and got me support that I need. Dozens more shelter beds and housing units are coming to Chilliwack. The city has seen a steep rise in homelessness in the past decade. Plus, deadly crash. Police say a young pedestrian has been killed in Surrey after being hit by a car and Sports is, is very important. It, it goes a long way. It, it builds a lot of character. We take you inside the new immersive digital gallery honoring Indigenous athletes in BC. This is CBC Vancouver News. Hello, I'm Dan Burrow. Thanks for joining us. More than 70 new shelter beds and modular housing units are coming to Chilliwack. That city has seen a rapid and concerning rise in homelessness over the past 10 years. As Liam Britton explains, it's being welcomed by the mayor and local groups who help unhoused people. Kathy, you want to come on up here? Kathy McHale says she's grateful that she has a roof over her head. This has now got me off the street and got me support that I need and the help that I need. She spent nine months at a Ruth and Naomi Mission shelter in Chilliwack, and then the past year in support of housing. Ruth and Naomi's operations in Chilliwack are set to get a boost. We are rapidly responding to the urgent housing needs of the most vulnerable in the community. With the province bringing in more shelter and supportive housing to Chilliwack, a focus is people living in encampments. It's not safe for anyone. Not for the neighbors, not for the surrounding community, and most of all, not for the people experiencing homelessness themselves. At the site of a former motel, a new modular supportive housing building is planned with 43 units. Ruth and Naomi Mission will run that site. And on Trithui Avenue, 30 new shelter beds at a wellness centre are in the works, run by Lookout Society. Now, a look at some of the recent numbers around homelessness in Chilliwack paint a bit of a troubling picture and could illustrate why this type of housing is so needed. In 2014, there were just 73 people in the community identified as homeless. Last spring, it had jumped to 413. 40% identified as Indigenous, although Indigenous people only make up 8% of the general population. People counted many reasons for being without shelter including high housing costs, health and addiction problems, or interpersonal and family issues. And sometimes, all of those issues at once. The shelter spaces are expected to be ready in a few weeks, with modular housing set to start rising in the summer, opening by the fall. Liam Britton, CBC News, Vancouver. Police say a man has been arrested, uh, arrested and released after officers found the body of a woman in the Lumbee area just east of Vernon. The man is believed to be involved in the woman's death. He has been released under a number of mandatory conditions. The RCMP says the officers were looking into an alleged abduction at the time they discovered the victim and believe she was a victim of foul play. Police say a pedestrian who was struck by a car in Surrey on Friday has now died. The RCMP says a Mercedes struck the 23-year-old at 61A Avenue and 144th Street. He was taken to hospital but did not survive. Police say the Mercedes also crashed into another vehicle that was stopped at a red light, causing it to roll over. The driver was also taken to hospital and has since been released. Mounties say they are cooperating. Fourteen thousand lives. That is the number of people killed by toxic drugs in BC since the province declared a public health emergency eight years ago. Over the weekend, a Richmond family whose loved one was killed by poison drugs organized a car rally aimed at destigmatizing drug addiction and use. As Michelle Gomez shows us, the family is pushing for better access to safe supply. <laughs> About a dozen cars paraded the streets of Richmond, decorated in purple. It's the color representing overdose prevention. Drug users um, don't always look like the vision people have of them. Uh, my son was a businessman. He had a job. Um, he struggled with mental illness and, and addiction. 
Debbie Tablotny says her son Curtis died of a toxic drug overdose in 2022. My brother died playing PlayStation in his bedroom. Uh, he, he went to work that day, he went home, he did drugs, and he, and he died. Curtis's family organized the car rally to bring awareness to the stigma that drug users face and to advocate for more government support, including mental health resources and safe supply. We didn't know where most of the services were. I would sit on the internet and research and research, and I could not find ways to help him. And when I did, he was turned down. In February, Richmond City Council resolved to ask health authorities to look into the possibility of a supervised drug consumption site at the city's hospital. But after hundreds protested the proposal at City Hall, the city announced it would not move forward. It's a tragedy in our community. It's not just the people who are passing away, it's the family and friends and co-workers, their neighbours. In the last eight years, more than 14,000 British Columbians have lost their lives to illicit toxic drugs. And the deaths escalated in 2023, with an average of almost seven deaths per day, up from 6.2 per day in 2022. It's the leading cause of death for people between the ages of 10 and 59. The reason we're here is because people are hiding in their bedrooms, and you don't know how many people are actually using and who's going to die tomorrow. You know, it's seven people in B.C. It's seven. The Tablotny family rode in Curtis's old car today, which they have since refurbished. My son always says, my oldest son, he loves driving it because that's his voice. The car motor is his voice and he revs the engine and said, this is my brother's voice. Be nice to each other. Michelle Gomez, CBC News, Richmond. To Vancouver Island now, where the Royal Canadian Navy is welcoming a new state-of-the-art Arctic patrol vessel in Esquimalt. It's been a tremendous amount of work to get us to this point, and it's been a phenomenal experience for our combined East and West Coast crew. This is the first new ship to join the Pacific Fleet on the West Coast in 25 years. Two similar vessels have already joined the East Coast Fleet and more coming in the next few years. It left Halifax, where it was built on March 11th, and traveled through the Panama Canal and up to BC, where family and friends greeted her. It's a wonderful day. You can see all the families are out. It's very exciting to welcome them here before they start their missions to the Arctic. So excited to see them. It's been a while since it's been a while since he's been back. So. Uh, it's great to be home. It's a good welcome home. It's a beautiful day in Victoria. Uh, see my beautiful family waiting for me has been great. We're happy to have you. <laughs> Feels great. Been gone for too long and I'm happy to be home. We're really happy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. During the weeks at sea, crews practiced emergency drills and small arms training. The ship has been named the HMCS Max Bernays after a Second World War coxswain. He helped take down an attacking Nazi U-boat while manning the bridge of his own Royal Canadian Navy ship. Rescues are still waiting to try to help an orca calf off Vancouver Island. The Department of Fisheries and Oceans says that Friday's attempt to guide the whale into open ocean didn't work. They're now considering using n different nets and boats or a sling to lift and carry the calf out of that area. It's been stuck in a tidal lagoon for more than three weeks after its mother died. BC is celebrating a leafy milestone. The government says 10 billion trees have now been planted in the province since reforestation programs began in 1930. The Ministry of Forest says 2 billion of those trees were planted in the past seven years. The government says it will plant another 50 million trees this year, focusing on areas that have been impacted by wildfires or mountain pine beetle, beetle infestations. A world-renowned conference defined by its short, unscripted, often inspiring talks on technology, entertainment and design is marking a decade in Vancouver. Leaders say TED Talks have been a major boost for the city's economy and its global influence. Chad Pawson has more on the impact of TED. TED is back on in Vancouver this week, taking over the convention center with its custom belt, wooden theater, and transforming the entire space into a well-appointed living room. Now, the conference is not the biggest that the city of Vancouver hosts, it's 2000 attendees, but the scope and influence of the people who come to be inspired and to listen, to spend money on hotels, restaurants, and activities is unique. TED, in bringing the kinds of people that it attracts from around the world that land in Vancouver, 
So not only is that a great calling card or, or advertisement or promotion for a city, but the other thing that we like about, about TED or conferences like that is it's not just about tourism, it's about connecting those decision makers hopefully with people that are in our city who are trying to make this a better place. Tourism advocates say it is unusual for a single city to host a conference like this for such a long stretch. Organizers say they love Vancouver, they love being here simply because it's so beautiful, but also because of their work with the Vancouver Convention Center that has allowed them to build a one-of-a-kind space. Organizers say many attendees, this conference is now a must-do. They come for the talks, but also Vancouver as well. After 10 years, people are now, uh, this is like marked on their calendar years in advance about kind of coming here uh, and that they get to branch out. This is a global destination. So we have people from all over the world who come here and utilize this wonderful um, place. But also it continues to give us the flexibility that we need. What more can we do? What more can we build? What activations and experiential things can we do? And the VCC is like, bring it on. Like what, what else can we help you with? Hosting conferences is a competitive business across the globe, says the Vancouver Convention Center. But when you get to say that you've hosted TED for 10 years, potential customers pay attention. Now, the organizers say they have no plans to move the corporates and are under contract for the next few years. Chad Pawson, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, some of us enjoyed some warmer weather over the weekend. Avalanche Canada is warning of the transition to what's known as an isothermal snowpack and increased avalanche risk. Whether you're planning on traveling in snow, for example, skiing, snowmobiling, hiking, or if you are just planning on going out on a more of a spring hike, as you get higher up, there could still be avalanche hazards if there's snow on the ground. In the spring, snow becomes wet and loses cohesion. The risk of avalanche is especially high in the afternoon when slopes may have been baking in the sun all day. Darius Madabi joins us with a first look at the weather. Interesting morning, especially after the sun we had, eh? Oh, yes. And uh, as we continue to warm up into the rest of this week, we wouldn't expect that warning to go away. Now, uh, it's important to talk about what exactly this means. So mm -hmm. isothermal, iso equal thermal heat or temperature. So it means the snowpack is the same temperature all the way through a given depth. And usually when uh, avalanche forecasters are using this term, it means it's above zero all the way through. And so this usually happens when we switch from our diurnal winter cycle where it's warmer during the day or above zero during the day and below zero during the night. And so we get that freezing, that crusty layer on top uh, overnight to a uh, less a, a non-diurnal cycle where it's just above zero all the way through. And that allows the snow all the way through the snowpack to become the same temperature. And as we see that uh, same temperature, that warmer above zero temperature go deeper and deeper into the snowpack, the bigger an avalanche you can get. So what we're looking at here is Whistler. You can see Whistler Mountain, Blackcomb Mountain. And over the weekend, the 48 hour period from noon Friday to noon Sunday, you can see that uh, blue means below zero, green means above zero. We were still dipping below zero on those higher peaks, but for much of the area and to those lower elevations, we weren't going, uh, we weren't getting back below zero again. So as we continue to move forward, as temperatures continue to come up, we see that risk of avalanche increasing once again. So uh, something to be on the lookout for if you are going to be doing any winter sports. Here in Vancouver, though, we did get a little bit of precipitation, uh, but no real at risk of avalanche. Uh, avalanches here because there hasn't been all that much snow lately, so not too much to worry about. But if you are going to be here in Vancouver over the next few days, expect lots of sunshine, which is the same thing we're looking forward to tomorrow morning, Dan. Okay, we'll check in later. Darius, thanks very much. Thank you. The BC Sports Hall of Fame has gone high tech with its newest project. The 3D Interactive Indigenous Sports Gallery profiles the accomplishments of more than a dozen Indigenous athletes, coaches and builders, bringing their stories to life virtually. Have a look. Thank you for joining us as we today open the door to the world's first fully immersive digital Indigenous sport gallery. I've had the chance to compete at everything except the Olympic Games. I've been the Olympic alternate twice. Everything I've accomplished in those four-year quads um, has helped me prepare. Now this time, I'm feeling really ready to achieve that goal. Sports is, is very important. It, it goes a long way. It, it builds a lot of character. It, it, it does a lot for, for our people. It gives us opportunities we, we might not have had before. You know, this is the, the true 
truth and reconciliation. When we come together, we have equal opportunities for sports. We acknowledge our people, your people, whoever people it is, and we, we, we acknowledge each other. With call to action number 87 of the Truth and Reconciliation Act calling sports halls of fame to provide public education that tells the national story of Aboriginal athletes in history, the digitization of the Indigenous Sport Gallery is another step forward in furthering this action. Within what you're going to experience is how technology has come our way in a fruitful way for us to understand ourselves and understand others. Canada was the last G7 country without a national school food program. Until now, tomorrow's federal budget will outline more details. And after the break, a Vancouver teacher tells us why it's about time. Stick around. Thanks for joining our commercial free live stream tonight. In Nanaimo, an alarming number of pedestrian deaths is prompting calls from advocacy groups to make streets safer. As Claire Palmer tells us, they want road infrastructure to focus on people rather than cars. It's intersections like this that have pedestrians on their heels in Nanaimo. There have been three pedestrian fatalities in the Nanaimo area in recent months. You know what, honestly, we only walk in our neighborhood. I mean, the street we live on does not have sidewalks. <laughs> That's true, but and we you just... do a lot of kind of no dog, you can't walk in the middle of the road because cars that come true. kind of fast, there's a lot of corners. That's Nobody true. is very good at driving slow. Strong Towns advocates for a new approach to urban planning and development. They believe more can be done from an infrastructure perspective, especially at intersections like this one here at Uplands and Departure Bay. Now, I don't feel that comfortable on this uh, gravel gutter here, uh, but if I were a couple feet over there onto an actual sidewalk, I'd feel much better. Nanaimo lacks a lot of pedestrian infrastructure. Um, most of Nanaimo doesn't have sidewalks, for example. Um, however, there are lots of roads that are, especially in the north end, overbuilt, uh, leading to drivers driving a lot faster and decreasing safety overall for pedestrians, anyone outside of a vehicle. In places like this, like, we got a sidewalk, but the roads are so wide that the cars are moving so fast that it's like, okay, I need to have my head on a swivel at all times. The city of Nanaimo knows there are problems with infrastructure as a result of the amalgamation of several communities in the 70s and say they're always looking to build back better to address these problems. Those were all developed and created under uh, different standards, um, really more rural standards than we would expect to see in a, in a current city. And so what that's left us with is a lot of gaps in our walking and biking infrastructure. Uh, and so yeah, it, it's an ongoing process to fill in these gaps. The city has been adjusting roads to be narrower, adding speed bumps or traffic circles when it's updating other public works. One such updated road, Metro Drive, even won an award for the changes the city implemented. But for strong towns, more needs to be done at a higher level. And at the provincial level, we really, really need to increase the amount of budget that the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure is sending towards projects that get people out of cars. For now, the group recommends pedestrians and motorists slow down and watch out to prevent further fatalities. Claire Palmer, CBC News, Nanaimo.
Federal Finance Minister Christian Freeland is set to present the 2024 federal budget tomorrow. We already know the Liberal government intends to spend billions of dollars on new initiatives. But as Ashley Burke explains, it's still not clear how it will balance that with its pledge of fiscal prudence. A new pair of shoes for a budget that might feel like a retrend. The finance minister's purchase from millennial and Gen Z entrepreneurs, the generation her party is trying to win over with its budget. We already have a good idea of what initiatives are in the budget, but we don't know how the government intends to pay for them. Our country cannot succeed unless young people succeed. The prime minister didn't offer any hints about new sources of revenue instead focusing on his message to young Canadians. Our country cannot succeed unless young people can imagine themselves succeeding. And they just don't feel that right now. So far, the Liberals have revealed $38 billion in commitments over a number of years. That will cover initiatives for housing, artificial intelligence and a national school food program. So far, about $17 billion in promises involve loan-based programs, about $21 billion could hit Canada's bottom line directly. Will we see the deficit grow? No. That means new revenue needs to come in. Let's be honest, they have to raise taxes. I mean, how else are we going to do this? I don't think that it should be a big secret, but can we do it in a thoughtful, provocative way? The NDP wants the government to make companies pay. Let's take on the corporate greed, which is driving up the cost of living. But experts warn if that happens, the cost could get passed on to consumers. When you're uh, looking to raise revenues, often you need to, to apply a, a, a tax that's going to affect a broad uh, portion of your uh, income earners. Otherwise, and that includes, uh, you know, middle income, uh, middle income uh, earners. So I'm not quite sure how we're going to get around this, to tell you honestly. The finance minister has repeatedly said the government will not raise taxes on the middle class. Tomorrow, we're expecting to find out if the wealthiest corporations and taxpayers may have to pay more. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. As we just heard, a national school food program is part of what's to come. We already know that the program will support existing provincial and territorial programs, meaning communities will have a say in how students get access to meals as well as what is served. Joining us now is someone who's been actively calling for a national program and has already made progress at their school. Brent Matsfield is the edible education teacher at Lord Roberts Elementary School in downtown Vancouver and founded co-founded Lunch Lab. It's a school meal program uh, that serves meals prepared by the students. Uh, thanks for joining us, Brent. Hey, pleasure to be here, Dan. So last fall, we did the story about you running 200 laps around <laughs> Lord Roberts Elementary to call attention to the need for this program finally happening. What do you hope to hear from the federal budget tomorrow? Hoping to hear, well, we, we know the $1 billion over five years is coming. We hope to hear a clear indication of working with provinces and territories, mm -hmm. what that's going to look like, that that money will flow to province and territories and Indigenous leaders, mm -hmm. And, and just some more parameters around how this money is going to get out to schools quickly. Based on, on your experience at Lord Roberts, how, how, much, how much do you need? Like, how, how much funding would be adequate in your, in your mind? Well, I mean, the, the whole goal of this program is for it to be cost-shared, mm -hmm. right? And we know that school districts and the province have invested this money, and by the, uh, the federal government investing this billion dollars, that just anchors this program mm -hmm. and sets an indication to school districts that this is something that they need to be doing. So this is a new mandate in education, mm -hmm. which is really exciting. We mentioned the fact that it's students that prepare the meals. It's not just about learning about food, uh, other life skills. What do, uh, what do students learn beyond just preparing a meal? Yeah, so Lunch Lab is a program that I'm, I've been part of co-founding in partnership with Growing Chefs, which is an amazing local charity here in Vancouver. And it's an opportunity to come in as a team work together, be mentored by chefs and residents, prepare a delicious meal. Mm -hmm. So they're learning knife safety, kitchen safety, but they're also learning how to work together, mm -hmm. how to care for one another, how to be a leader in their school. And then lunch is about learning. So they sit down and they actually enjoy a meal together. They have time to eat. They're not rushed. They have the opportunity to pay attention to the levels of hunger and fullness. They can go get more if they need it. They choose where they get to sit. I mean, the conviviality of what I think we hope all people learn, mm -hmm. not just how to take care of themselves and what they need to eat, but how to be part of a community that is sharing food together. What are the, some of the biggest changes that you've noticed in the time that you started this program from kids that were, were food vulnerable to now being in the program? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just the, the experience of whether it's in a garden, whether it's in a kitchen, whether it's in lunch lab, just that experience transforms how they eat, 
what they're willing to eat, that kind of dinner table etiquette, mm -hmm. um, lunch room etiquette. I come into the lunch room, there's 200 kids, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a crowded room, and we can have a conversation like we're having now, right? So it's, it's not chaos, mm -hmm. it's enjoyment, it's conversations, it's laughter, it's kids enjoying food together, and that's all kids, right? Mm -hmm. And some kids might come from homes where they need that even more, they need that modeled to them more, they need the access to food, but this is something that all students benefit from. I don't believe children should leave high school without having a good sense of how to prepare food for themselves, mm -hmm. knowing where to get that from, and you know, all the, all the skills that are needed that they're gonna need for the rest of their life. We know programs like this, whether it be federal, provincial, can take time because they're, is bureaucracy involved? How quickly do you think something like this, beyond what you're doing at Lord Roberts, can be uh, expanded to other? Yeah, programs I mean, I, I, I think in BC we're very lucky where there's a lot of movement that's already happening because of the provincial investment that's happened and just the leadership from BC around around food in general and food uh, school food programs. So I'm really hopeful that we'll see the impact of this in September, and I, we're really hopeful that we see Premier David Eby step up and openly accept and sign this agreement and get these funds flowing quickly and take leadership for other provinces across Canada. Canada, because we heard from the Prime Minister and the Ministers, they want to see this money spent in September, right? So let's let's make sure that we make that happen and figure out what we need to to make sure that this is impacting kids and their ability to learn and their lifelong health September school year. New year. Brent Mansfield, we appreciate your time. Thanks very much for coming. Thank you for having me, Dan. He's had many court appearances in the last few years, but for the first time ever, Donald Trump was in criminal court. The next big challenge for the court picking an unbiased jury. That's next. Here in Vancouver, along the banks of the Fraser River, money from a provincial fund put to good use to protect against flooding. It's one of thousands of pro projects from the Community Emergency Preparedness Fund. Advocates say it's a beacon of hope for municipalities. There is definitely more demand. Uh, and since the fund was started in 2017, actually, we have approved 1,868 projects. Against the threat of wildfires and flooding, most municipalities do not have the tax base to pay for major infrastructure changes. So they have to turn to things like the fund. In its first year, 241 people applied to the fund. Last year was double that amount. The Union of BC Municipalities say towns and municipalities are desperate for help, but the fund may not be keeping up with demand. But whether we are getting what we are asking for is another question. Um, because as you know, climate change is one of the biggest issues that we are facing. So the, the, the plans required by the province um, have become more complex. So they're asking more of us. And yet, when we ask for more funding, we are not getting it. Now, the fund is increasingly paying for more complex projects, with the most expensive ones coming in the last year. Things like flood mitigation, erosion projects, dike upgrades, even air conditioners for social housing in Vancouver. The province says it's committed to keep growing the fund and has increased funding for it dramatically over the past six years. Now, so far this year, flooding risk in BC has been minimal, but it is a expected to be another bad season for wildfires, meaning cities and towns will be looking for help with that and have few options to rely on other than provincial funding. Chad Pawson, CBC News, Vancouver.
A victim of a 30-year-old cold case is now speaking out. He's one of three children assaulted in Ontario in the 1990s by an alleged attacker known then as the Woodland Rapist. Thomas Dagla has more on what led to the break in the case. In three separate Ontario parks, children were each tied to a tree and assaulted. Three decades later, police have finally charged an alleged sex predator with those attacks. And one victim is speaking to CBC News. The police handled the situation very poorly in the beginning. They accused me of making up what happened to me to get attention. We're concealing the man's identity because it's covered by a publication ban. He's 39 years old. I was able to help them find evidence. And his words are spoken by a CBC producer seen here. Yeah, they shot me get up. From the mid-90s, police hunted the unidentified attacker, dubbed the Woodland Rapist, and published this composite sketch. They never made an arrest until just last month. I was shaking when I received the call. I felt overwhelmed with joy, then sadness as I started to recall the memories of that day. 64-year-old Richard Neal is now facing 20 charges, including kidnapping and sexual assault in connection with those attacks. He uh, is not guilty, and uh, certainly the presumption of innocence uh, applies. As for what recently led police to Neal, the victim says he was told by a detective that a relative of the accused submitted DNA to an Ancestry-type website and that finally provided a break in the cold case. Police agencies, investigative agencies are realizing this is a brand new tool and it's incredibly powerful. Peel Regional Police wouldn't confirm genetic genealogy was used in this case, though the man assaulted as a child in that Brampton Park recalls leading investigators to DNA evidence that may yet prove crucial. They finally took me seriously when they connected DNA evidence found at all three locations where the assaults took place. Police have found three victims, and they say there could be more. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. Pro-Palestinian protesters blocked access to the Delta Port Terminal in Metro Vancouver this afternoon. Protesters say the demonstration was aimed at disrupting Israeli shipping services. It says more than 100 people took part. Terminal operator GCT Canada says the protesters' actions caused a, quote, unsafe situation as truckers tried to get to the container terminal for several hours. Meanwhile, Israel says it will respond to the weekend attack by Iran. Tehran claimed the attack was in response to a strike on the Iranian consulate in Damascus earlier this month. Israel has not confirmed or denied it was behind that attack. Now Israel's allies, including Canada, are warning against escalating the conflict further. The CBC's Chris Brown has more from Jerusalem. The aerial barrage Iran unleashed on Israel overnight Saturday could have caused tremendous damage. Instead, Iran telegraphed the attack in advance, giving the air defenses of Israel, the United States and other countries time to prepare and shoot down all but a few of the projectiles. Yes, yeah. In a desert Bedouin community in Israel's south, a seven-year-old girl suffered a head injury from falling shrapnel. The children were frightened and wanted to run away from home, and that's when the missile hit, said her father. After a meeting of its war cabinet, Israel's military chief of staff vowed a response is coming. This launch of so many missiles, cruise missiles and drones, will be met with a response, said Herzi Halevi. Across Europe and beyond, there are calls for restraint. We are working urgently with our allies to de-escalate the situation and prevent further bloodshed. We have been coordinating a diplomatic response to seek to prevent escalation. But unlike in Gaza, where Israel was largely in control and able to deflect international criticism of its conduct, it may have to listen more now. It required military coordination with the U.S. and even Israel's Arab neighbors, such as Jordan, to counter the Iranian strikes. We've carried out the attack on Israel in the framework of deterrence, said Iran's foreign minister, noting it was Israel that struck first by destroying its consulate in Damascus, Syria. He warned if Israel responds, Iran will not hesitate to attack again. Even if Israel does hit back, 
It's going to be something quite symbolic, I think, at this point. This Iran specialist says the country calibrated its attack to ensure Israeli casualties would be minimal, meaning Israel's response should be similar. In a sense, they, they gave Israel at least a ladder to not attack in a severe way, which would force them in a way to retaliate and, and to kind of escalate things to a much more violent uh, course. The confrontation with Iran has at least temporarily shifted the world's focus away from Gaza and Israel's war with Hamas and now also the West Bank, where violence between Israeli settlers and Palestinians has erupted. Chris Brown, CBC News, Jerusalem. Canada has announced sanctions against some people and entities allegedly involved in the ongoing conflict in Sudan. This comes as the war in the northeastern African nation, some have deemed forgotten, marks one year. France hosted a humanitarian conference today to put a spotlight on the violence and suffering in Sudan. Millions in the country have been facing famine during the year-long fighting, and there is no end in sight. More than 14,000 people have died, and twice as many injured since last April. Sudan's army and its powerful paramilitary force continue to battle for control in the capital, Khartoum, and other areas. The UN estimates nearly 9 million people have been forced to flee their homes. Donald Trump's hush money trial is now underway in New York. The former president faces 34 counts of fraud but denies any legal wrongdoing and remains defiant. As Chris Reyes reports, this is the first, time, first criminal trial of any U.S. president, past or present. The rigorous process to pick a jury is now underway in the criminal case against Donald Trump in the state of New York. The charges... 32 counts of falsifying business records to conceal a crime, all in connection with alleged hush money payment to three different people, including the adult film star Stormy Daniels. Donald Trump spoke to cameras just before entering the courtroom for his historic trial, repeating accusations. This is a persecution like never before. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. And again, it's a case that should have never been brought. It's an assault on America. And that's why I'm very proud to be here. A large pool of potential jurors will be asked 42 questions that include whether they've attended Trump rallies, what media they consume, or what political groups they support. The judge has ruled that lawyers won't be allowed to ask if a potential juror is Republican or Democrat or who they voted for in the last presidential election. From hundreds, 12 will be chosen and up to six alternates. Ultimately, you want fairness. You want people that are going to go in there with an open mind, who will pay attention, who will not be sort of enamored by the fact that Donald Trump is a, basically a celebrity, and they'll be fair in terms of their ultimate verdict. In court, Trump's lawyers told the judge that the former president plans to be a part of every aspect of the proceedings, prompting a warning from the judge to Trump that he could be jailed if he interrupts the proceedings. Outside the courthouse, pro and anti-Trump demonstrators gathered with their signs and their flags. I'm here to celebrate that Trump's going to get another five points in the polls, because as far as I'm concerned, Trump just won his third election. Thank you, Alvin Bragg. Trump is a chronic liar. He, almost everything that comes out of his mouth is a lie. He has a, he has a problem with the truth. At the end of the first day, outside the courthouse, more comments. My son has graduated from high school, and it looks like the judge will not let me go through the graduation of my son, who's worked very, very hard. Uh, he's a great student. It looks like the judge isn't going to allow me to escape this scam. It's a scam trial. Trump has denied all allegations against him. He has said that he will testify. As the defendant in a criminal case, he is required to be present during the entire proceeding. The trial is expected to last two months. Chris Reyes, CBC News, New York. An unprecedented coral bleaching event. What bleaching is and why it matters after this. Tudoro Alcutas, a Filipino Canadian journalist, is at Mountain View Cemetery in Vancouver to witness the unveiling of a tombstone for the first Filipino settler in Canada, Benson Flores. We discovered and we're honoring one of our own. To document Flores's life, Alcutas has been partnering with another Filipino Canadian journalist, Joseph Lopez 
who discovered Benson Flores after a trip to Bowen Island in 2011. He was reading the book by Irene Howard called uh, Bowen Island. There was a page with Benson Flores' picture and a few lines, you know, describing that he was Filipino. After years of research, Lopez finally found a record of Flores in Canada's 1911 census. It's reported that he arrived in 1861. Because he had some properties in, in Bowen Island. He had a float house. He was operating uh, the first boat rental there. Alcorta says records show Flores remained a bachelor all his life and died on April 11, 1929, at the age of 81. He was laid to rest at Mountain View Cemetery in Vancouver. But somehow his assets were not enough to pay his liabilities. So consequently, he was buried as uh, he was declared an insolvent. Until recently, the official Canadian records listed Filipino migration as starting in the 1930s. But the discovery of Flores changed the narrative. Even though we have oral traditions and histories of Filipinos coming to the coast of British Columbia in the 17th and 18th century, he's the first one officially recorded uh, in uh, the government of Canada. I think this makes it exciting for the next generation. We can connect by seeing where they lived, where they worked, and where they're buried today. And at that time, there were only about seven, less than ten Filipinos in Benz uh, on Bowen Island. But now we're 175,000 or more in British Columbia alone. So we're one of the fastest growing immigrant community in this country, and Benson Flores paved the way. El Cortez is working on a documentary to memorialize Benson Flores. He hopes to have the film ready for release by the May of this year. Saurabh Sandhu, CBC News, Vancouver. Tesla is reportedly planning to lay off 10% of its workforce as it grapples with slumping sales. Cuts could affect about 14,000 workers employed by the electric vehicle company. The details appear to be from an internal memo sent by CEO Elon Musk. Tesla sales dropped sharply last quarter amid growing competition around the world. Even price cuts have failed to attract more buyers, with sales down nearly 9% in the first quarter compared to 2023. Coral reefs help sustain life in oceans. Now scientists say this crucial ecosystem is under further threat as reefs around the world experience a fourth mass bleaching. And as Anand Ram reports, it's because of warming oceans brought about by climate change. The iconic Great Barrier Reef, lively, but among the colors all this ghostly white, signs it's struggling once again. Right now, we're, we're currently experiencing a global scale marine heat wave that is unprecedented. Scientists say hot ocean temperatures have affected corals in every ocean, calling it the fourth global bleaching event on record. And they're seeing more and more reefs affected every week. So if that trend continues, this event will be more the most spatially expense, uh, expansive uh, global bleaching event on record in as little as a few weeks, potentially. Corals, both organism and habitat to a quarter of all marine life, are very sensitive to heat. Marine heat waves can last for years. They're sitting in these elevated temperatures for very long periods of time, becoming physiologically stressed. That stress can drive away fish, and if temperatures stay hot, eventually kill the corals. Which would disrupt the tourism and recreation for nearby communities, but also a vital food supply. 
we know that fish um, provide valuable protein and micronutrients, it's unlikely that you'll find a substitute that'll be equally as nutritious and affordable for local communities. Still, there is hope corals can recover if temperatures stabilize, but that could take more than a decade. And scientists are seeing climate change increase the intensity and frequency of bleaching level heat. When bleaching occurs more frequently, there is just no energy, no time for corals to recover. And as oceans absorb the excess carbon from humanity's greenhouse gas emissions, scientists warn these beautiful marine forests are being pushed closer to extinction. Anand Ram, CBC News, Toronto. Darius Madavi joins us now with our BC-wide forecast. The full version, but you have more on where this coral bleaching is happening. Yes, so they have a very cool globe graphic there. I wish I had one as cool. I just have a flat map, but you can see here pretty clearly how uh, widespread all those bleaching... Uh, the, the heat required for these intense bleaching events are. Uh, just last year, actually, they had to add new levels to this. So they added levels three to five in terms of the, uh, the strength, the extremity of this bleaching because we had seen such unprecedented heat. And these coral reefs support, uh, it's estimated, at least a quarter of all marine life. And since our land food webs are so interconnected with our marine food webs, it means that this is really a, a global problem. No matter where you are, this is going to affect you, your food supply, and really these ecosystems all around the world. Uh, now, as we heard, not necessarily the, the be all end all that this has happened. Fourth mass bleaching event in the last 30 years, which is all the ones on record because we are seeing uh, such, such new and intense ocean heat. Uh, but corals can recover. And one important thing to note is that it's not just heat that stresses them. It's also things like ocean acidity, also driven by climate change, but also other human activities like pollution or uh, overfishing in these areas that can damage the corals. And so if we take actions to prevent some of these other activities that also damage the corals, we remove one other stress on them, and that can give them more energy to focus on keeping up with the heat. So in uh, uh, many places, I should say, are doing a great job of doing that, protecting their corals so that they can focus on just uh, recovering from that single stressor. Now, with that being said, let's turn to our uh, BC wide weather. No extreme heat here today. We had a cold wave, uh, a cold front move through that actually dropped temperatures throughout much of the province for the southeast. That it might still be coming for some places, uh, but a little bit of precipitation activity across places, uh, mostly showers and flurries, unless you're up in the northeast where we actually saw a very decent dump of snow in the Fort Nelson region, anywhere from 10 to 15 centimeters of snow with some more on the way overnight. So a bit of good news there, which is why we have that snowfall warning, uh, no radar coverage there. So that's why I'm putting the warning up, but also special weather statement for uh, Eagle Pass to Rogers Pass, expecting some decent snowfall overnight there as well, but should start to clear up by the morning, which we can see here on our precipitation forecast province-wide. Some scattered uh, showers and flurries across the board tomorrow before we start to calm down there as well. Generally expect uh, sunnier conditions, warmer conditions throughout the week, and after these, uh, this little bit of activity clears up, which is the same story here in Vancouver, where we have lots of sunny days ahead as temperatures climb mm -hmm. to the end of the week, Dan. Okay, Doris, thanks very much. Thank you. If you want to buy a recreational vehicle to drive around this summer, you're now in luck. It's a buyer's market. Sales soared during the pandemic, but have since fizzled. And as Paula Duhacek tells us, many RV owners are trying to get rid of theirs. All right, here's the unit. Jason Huntley bought this RV in 2018, but with his kids growing up, he's trying to sell. Has all your, everything you need from home on wheels. Emphasis on trying. It's been listed online almost a year. I've uh, let the ad expire, as you would say, and then restarted it a few times. Uh, but interest is pretty minimal. Problem is, the market is very different from a few years ago. RV sales surged during the pandemic. It was a way that people could still travel and have family vacations while staying close to home. But these days, people who can afford to go on vacation can take an airplane to get there. Plus, amid high interest rates and inflation, other people who may want an RV just can't afford one anymore. People have a little bit less discretionary income, and so they may have delayed their purchasing. People aren't just putting off their purchases. A growing number are also selling off their RVs using the website rvdealers.ca. We get people trading in their units, um, and we also have the certain cases where uh, people maybe decided to just get out of the lifestyle completely. It was basically turbocharged uh, demand, 
and that's not sustainable per permanently. Still, this analyst thinks the industry will bounce back. Many of these customers are going to stay in the outdoor lifestyle, and I think that's going to help sell more RVs longer term because you're going to have a, a wider customer pool than you did pre-pandemic. As for seller Jason Huntley, he still expects some short-term trouble unloading his RV. I don't believe we've seen like the worst of it yet. He's still hoping to sell, but isn't holding his breath. Paula Duhacek, CBC News, Calgary. Coming up, we play Name the Athlete as a Paris-bound Olympian plays hard to guess and answers some big questions themselves. All things wizard are coming up. Food, it's a basic human right, but something that many people in Cranbrook struggle to afford as the cost of living continues to climb. Food bank usage has increased by 15% in Canada, so we know it's an issue that many Canadians are facing. In Cranbrook, we see a 58% increase, up to very significantly uh, higher um, than even the increase that we see across the rest of the country. The increase, according to the report and testimonials from clients, is due to the rising cost of groceries, housing and living expenses. The Cranbrook Food Bank has increased its daily supply of hampers from around 30 to 100. We are, are in the midst of a cost of living crisis. The two things that we all need, food and shelter, and those are the two costs that keep on increasing. The report suggests that more people would likely access the food bank if it weren't for stigma. So we really need to have those open, honest conversations, break down those stigmas, because at the end of the day, we have to make sure people are fed. The report shows that health care is hard to come by in Cranbrook, and a lack of suitable housing has contributed to Cranbrook's difficulty attracting skilled workers, including health care professionals. It is an issue we hear about across the province, um, but again, hearing, hearing about it in this context, unfortunately, didn't surprise me. About one in seven tenant households in Cranbrook live in some form of subsidized housing, but there's not enough available to meet the needs. The commissioner hopes the report will change that by providing more agency to organizations like the food bank to advocate for themselves. We uh, want to empower people living in, in the four communities that we uh, looked at in a deep way and give back to the communities who shared so much with us about their experiences. What we're really hoping comes from it is change. Policy change uh, is really what we're wanting. Rose hopes that the report will shed light on food insecurity on a provincial and federal level as more and more people struggle with the basic need. More information from the Baseline Project is expected to be released this summer. Corey Bullock, CBC News, Cranbrook. Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. On May 9th, join CBC Vancouver's Dan Burrett at the Surrey Board of Trade's Top 25 Under 25 Awards, celebrating the incredible initiatives of Surrey's youth. And CBC Vancouver is the exclusive media partner of the DOXA Documentary Film Festival, May 2nd to 12th. Enjoy thoughtful and engaging documentaries, special presentations, and industry events. For festival information, visit doxafestival.ca.
With the Paris Summer Olympics only three months away, Canadian athletes are counting down the days to qualify. Paige Crozon is honing her skills as a three-on-three -three basketball player and is getting some help. And as Erin Collins tells us, it comes from her five-year-old daughter. As with any good team, communication is key. Do you need me to hold it for you? It may not look like it, but this is part of Olympic hopeful Paige Crozen's daily training routine. Five-year-old Poppy helping to keep her mom moving. Okay, let's go, girl. Nice. This single mom focused on getting to the Olympics in Paris. Her daughter along for the ride. Okay, so we're going to start like this. Every step of the way. Land it. Poppy pitching in to help Paige achieve her Olympic dream. So, like... One hand at the bottom and the other hand on the side, and then frog, drop neck. Nice. So what's harder, making a three-point shot or being a single mom? Well, I've probably taken about 50,000 three-point attempts in my career, and it's my first time being a single mom, so definitely being a single mom. The technicality kept Paige from getting to the last Olympics, the first for her sport of three-on-three -three basketball. Now we go, Paige. Poppy was there too, helping to provide perspective. Coming home to Poppy and she comes and runs up and gives me a big hug and then she tells me about the scrape on her knee and that's the biggest thing in her world. Besides. And now the push is on to get to Paris. Paige and her teammates prepping to play in a qualifying tournament in May, confident in their team's chances. We just need to get our reps in and get our flow and we'll be set. We have so many great pieces and we'll figure it out. The entire team encouraged by the development of its smallest member. 11, 12, 13, 14. We've seen Poppy grow for the last five years as she started playing 3x3, like literally from birth, you know. So, <laughs> And win or lose, the real lessons learned on this court have little to do with basketball. Find something that you love, something that you're passionate about. Find a great group of friends and a community within that. And then do that for as long as you can at whatever level you choose. I think we're at two. This team already winning no matter the score. Sometimes if you make bigger bunny ears, it is a little bit easier. But whatever your preference is. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Lethbridge. Speaking of Olympic-bound athletes... Mm -hmm. Two CBC Kids News journalists got the chance to sit down with the Paris-bound break dancer Phil Wizard. Here's the catch, though. They didn't know who was behind the screen or what sport they were actually being part of. Here's how the guesswork went down. Have a look. Is your sport and team sport? No. Does it require any, like, are there any objects in your sport? No. Is it in the water? No. Huh. Is it outdoors? Yes, it can be. It will be in Paris. Uh, can't be that. Um, Do you have any like special equipment? No. I kind of want to guess. Breakdancing? Correct. Nice to meet you. I'm Arjun. Arjun. Gabrielle. Gabrielle, nice to meet you. So I want to start off with the name, but we're not going to call you Phil, we're going to call you Wizard, because that's what you're known as. Can you talk to me about that, that name that people call you? Yeah, so the Wizard, um, Phil Wizard comes from the fact that my first original crew, so in breaking we often have like crews and stuff that you form when you first start dancing. Uh, my first crew was called the Wizard's crew. <laughs> So people said like Phil from the Wizards crew and then eventually just naturally got shortened to like Phil Wizard. What's one thing people think they know about great dancing doesn't really know or get wrong? I think people don't know that like um, competitively people think like the person who spins the most or something is going to win. In breaking it's not the fastest or the strongest who wins. It's often the person who's the most creative or who's dancing the most kind of thing. Since you're a wizard in real life, who's your favorite like a wizard in the in the fictional world. Um, there's a lot of wizards. Hey, it's now or never, man. It's now or never. That's true. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, you know what? I'm gonna go classic, um, but we're gonna go with the Harry Potter world. But I actually don't like Harry that much. Um, I find him kind of annoying. Controversial. Is this a hot? Oh, this yo, is, we got this is where a I get controversial canceled, right? take. This is where I get canceled. I'm gonna go with Ron because I think Ron's hilarious. So, yeah, yeah. Ron from uh, Harry Potter. Okay. If you had time to check out Evans mm -hmm. in Paris, what's one thing like you would like to see? 
Oh, there's so many. I made friends, really good friends with the Park family who, uh, who do Taekwondo, so I'd love to see them do their thing. And super randomly, I want to see Equestrian, because I think it's in Versailles and it's like super majestic. Um, and I love horses, never been on a horse, yeah. but I think I love horses and I think it'd be cool to watch. Uh, so one thing I want to ask you, what's one thing that a, a casual fan should pay attention to when they're watching uh, Break Dancing for the first time? My suggestion, if you're watching it, is almost to like pick a character and kind of root for them. Well, I grew up like playing a lot of video games, watching a lot of like anime and superhero movies, and I think Breaking is similar to that, where everyone dances so differently. You know, everyone approaches the dance so it's differently. So pick the one that resonates with you kind of the most, and just move for them. Done. Awesome. Thank you guys very much. Nice to meet you. That was awesome. Great. Yeah. Thank you guys. And good luck to all our Canadian Olympians. I can't wait to see it. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, thanks for being with us tonight on CBC Vancouver News at six. You can watch this newscast on CBC Gem, our free app, as well as on YouTube and our website, cbc.ca slash bc. And Zara Premji will have your next local news at 11 o'clock, right after the National. See you then.